Hello and welcome to CG Visuals, my name is Zach, and today we're going to learn how to customise and composite the Pirio Incantatum effect from Trap Code Magic. So starting off in After Effects, we're going to import the project rather than opening it, so we'll make sure we go to the Trap Code Particular version 5 folder as we are using version 5 for this tutorial. And that will bring in the self-contained folder structure that has the effect, so you can import multiple projects into the same workspace. And so we'll give the export comp a little while to load there, because this is a live simulation with all of the uh, compositing effects. The export comp is probably the slowest uh, place to preview the simulation, but we'll cover how to speed that up as we go. And you'll notice that I'm just double checking that we are in fact working in 32 bits. As that uh, amount of colour information does actually benefit the compositing and contribute to those more punchy looking glow effects. And then we can open up the particles comp. And once this loads, you'll see we have our simulation in a 3D space. So this one is very complex. There's a lot of particle systems happening at the same time. So one thing we're going to do to speed this up is just, you know, isolate certain particle systems. For example, we don't need to see everything at the same time, but we can rotate around this effect. If you open up the project and you're, uh, you know, you just want to learn a little bit more about it, you can look at this casting overview, and this just tells you about what the settings do. So you can just get an idea of what's actually happening behind the scenes. We have this grid here, which is the floor that everything interacts with. And if we click the shy switch there to toggle the hidden layers, you can see now we have a color-coded green and red, so you can quickly get an idea of uh, which ones are which. And so we can start breaking this down. We have the wand flare, the sparks, the floating sparks. The uh, beam is separated into two layers here. So you could have this as just one half of the effect. And then the impact itself is built up with these different flares and light streaks that all animate to create that uh, that nice kind of glow. We also have the exploding liquid magma that pours onto the floor. So that's quite expensive. We uh, you know, we can toggle that off when we're just looking at the beams. And then we'll just do the same for the uh, Expelliarmus as well. So you can see how this effect is all built up. So what I like to do is when we're just, uh, you know, trying to get this into a scene, is just to toggle on two of the beams here. So these are the uh, core beams of the effect. And if we just go and disable the motion blur, reduce the particle count in the rendering tab there, that's just a visibility thing, doesn't actually change any of the uh, emission rate or anything. We've now very quickly created a custom proxy simulation. So now when we rotate around this effect, we can actually get some pretty good interactivity, which is going to make things much more enjoyable when we're compositing into the scene. So now I'm going to bring in this custom footage plate, and I've deliberately chosen one that uh, presents quite a few challenges. Uh, as you can see, we have this drone camera here. And we're going to go ahead and 3D track this in just a moment. And uh, I deliberately chose, you know, one of the most uh, difficult shots uh, to work with so that, you know, you can see how to resolve everything. Uh, for this track, I'm going to put in a custom 24 millimeter uh, focal length there, just as a guess. Enable detailed analysis. And so we're getting some uh, tracking markers here. Now I want to work out in 3D space where the center of the beam between these two actors would be. So if I select the right points here, it'll triangulate 
a space between them and then I can just set the ground plane and origin and then create a solid and camera. And because we set the ground plane and origin, the, the position of that layer is zero. And uh, one thing we can do as well to help normalize things is just rotate that into the correct position. So this is where our first problem occurs. If we just go ahead and use that tracked camera, we can see here that it's not really relating to, uh, you know, it thinks the effect is much smaller than it actually is. And that's because of the normalization of the camera scale itself. So if we just pick whip the camera to that solid that we created, we can now start normalizing the camera space by setting the position to 960 by 540 as that's half of the comp dimensions. And then in the orientation, we're going to set that to 270 by 0 by 0. And so now 3D objects should appear in the center of our comp. And if we now bring in this updated camera, we can see what kind of a difference that made. Remember, we're not actually moving the simulation or affecting the track itself. We're just changing um, the variables about the camera. So the effect is still still too small, uh, as you can see. I'm just going to bring in the plate as a reference, put some curves on it so that we can just see the uh, what's going on a little bit easier. And one way we could move the whole effect uniformly is to select the grid, all of the layers and the keyframes of that impact locator. And we could try pushing that back in 3D space, but then you know, we're going to run into the problem of the effect looking too small. So I'm going to create a new reference 3D solid. As you can see, it does appear in the center of our ground plane. And if we just uh, put the opacity down, we're going to just use a little trick to rescale the camera space by pick whipping the camera to the object changing the scale, you can see we're not actually changing the track or anything like that. We're just changing the the actual world scale uh, that the camera exists in. So this is like a way of scaling, uh, growing or shrinking the particle simulation without actually changing everything. So let's go ahead again and we'll select all of our layers so that we can move them uniformly. And so we can uh, try pushing that back. So still seems like the scale might be a little bit off. Let's go and check the, uh, the grid here. We'll just scale this up so we can see it a bit better. You can actually see it's not sticking to the ground and that's because we forgot to position our grid to the same coordinates as our ground there, which is 540, as that's the position that we set for our reference object here. So now our grid is actually aligned to the ground, and you can see we actually overcompensated and moved things back too far in 3D space. So we're actually going to do the opposite now, and just bring it more towards the camera. And uh, you can see we may have overcompensated the scale as well, so we can just bring the scale back down until we get something where, you know, we're still going to manually position our casting emitters here, but they're approximately in the right sort of space here. So we only need to make some small adjustments. As you can see, if we group all the keyframes there, we can move that uniformly. And now it's just a case of making some smaller adjustments to the position of our casting locator. And because uh, the beam has a little bit of a delay on it, and we want the beam to already be fully developed, we're actually going to move our camera and our plate forward by one second. So into the animation, it'll uh, already be fully conjoined there. And so as you can see, our ground plane does stick to the floor, and everything's in the right kind of space. So now it's simply a case of making sure that these emitters are actually more precisely aligned to the actor's ones. So quite simple, we're just going to press P 
alt left click to get rid of the wiggle expression and now we can just manually place some keyframes. And so we'll just go through here and we're just going to make sure uh, the casting locators are in the right location once we've done that because the actors are quite far away. Uh, we don't have to be super accurate but you know we can get more accurate uh, if we can actually see the ones like we can see this actor's wand a little bit more clearly. So for this uh, for this guy, I'm going to actually use a little bit more precision by using the page up and down buttons on the keyboard combined with the arrow keys. So I can go forward a few frames, use the arrow keys to get the uh, the locator in the correct. And now you can see that the uh, the ones stay in place. And remember, we want to reverse the changes we did to these beams. So we're going to re-enable the motion blur, set the particle amount back to 100 and uh, enable all of the effects except for the grid so now we have everything enabled as it should be and now it's simply a case of uh, just previewing this effect and at full res it brings in all of the detail with the sparks and everything And uh, that's pretty much all you have to do for a moving shot. Now we're just going to pre-render this asset so that we can play around in the compositing without any delays. So I'm setting that to a quick time animation with alpha. Uh, so that will preserve the quality and the alpha channel. Render out this effect. And at full res that took about an hour. So that's why we want to pre-render it. But now we can just bring that asset into the comp and uh, all you really had to do on our end was just make sure that the camera space was correct and uh, and then it does all the work for us. Now these uh, distortion keyframes here are uh, we obviously changed the timing so we're going to want to redo those uh, distortion keyframes but first I'm just going to put a bit of basic color grading on the plate here just get something more interesting so normally the beams are a lot closer to the camera by default, so that's why the uh, distortion looked a little bit too strong. But since we've moved the beams back in 3D space, I'm going to manually just do some keyframes here. So when the beams first conjoin, they create this big kind of flash. And when that happens, uh, we have a little bit of distortion just to make the effect look more interesting and then as that beam starts to fade away the flash we can just set the distortion to zero and we also have this ground uh, environment lighting that's automatically generated and if we just drag the this environmental lighting distance slider we can just get the lighting into the correct position there and so that also saves us quite a bit of time and that will animate with the beams so let's just uh, check that we didn't overdo the distortion. Just adds a lot of extra punch to that initial impact. And uh, one thing we can do is actually just customize this glow. Because usually the effect is a lot larger uh, or in a close-up shot. But we're actually going to put in some custom values here. And that's just going to give us a slightly more condensed glow. Bringing in a bit more of the color values that we want. And we also have this compound blur, which uh, can just soften the effect and the colors a little bit, but we're going to keep this quite sharp at a lower value. And so now we have our scene lighting, we have all our glows, the effect is tracked into the uh, shot that we have. And remember, if this was just a static shot, you could skip all the uh, camera steps that we did, but... I thought it was worth to show, you know, how we'd uh, put this into a 3D, into an actual live action moving plate and uh, how to readjust the the scale of the effect with the camera normalization technique that we did. And then we can just put a few little color correction sort of enhancements here. So in this Lumetri color, we can just add a bit of a, 
vignette the edges, darkening the edges. Maybe just adjust the color temperature here. Yeah, I think a warm color can be a, look a little bit more cinematic. So we've just added that basic little enhancement. And of course you could go further, you can add like lens dirt and other effects like that. And of course sound effects are half of it as well. So now we're going to uh, move on to our second exercise. So brand new project, I'm just going to do the same thing we did last time, import the version 5 Pyro and Cantatum effect into a new project. And this time we have a, a completely different plate and this will present its uh, its own unique uh, challenges. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting shot. The camera is panning back quite quickly. So let's start by going into the particles comp. And since we know that we just want to go straight to working with the simulation, we're just going to isolate one of the beams, as this is a close-up shot, we're only going to see half of the effect. And like we did before, in the rendering tab, just turn off the motion blur, reduce the particles count, enable the grid, and to get started, we'll just uh, make a few steps in the right direction, simply rotating the camera into a similar kind of perspective. Uh, this is quite a zoomed in shot, so we can actually change the focal length of the camera there. So this is something you couldn't do with stock footage, because we're going to get uh, up close and personal with this beam. I actually just want almost real-time interactivity here, so I'm going to reduce the particle amount to 10. Just because I uh, you know, I only need a very basic representation of, of what it's going to look like. So okay, yeah, we definitely want the beam coming towards the camera. Let's actually take our plate and paste that into the particles comp so we can use it as a reference. And just resize that. And I'm going to move the plate forward so that when the shot starts, the the effect is already... Because uh, there's a little bit of a delay on the effect. There's a big explosion and stuff. So two seconds in, the beams will already be fully on screen. And so, as you can see, we can see our floor plane there just giving us a little bit of help to align things. And you'll notice I'm not actually going to 3D track this shot. And that's because because of the nature of the effect, it's like this very volatile lightning. Uh, we can actually get away with just not tracking the shot, and all we're going to do is just make sure that the the wand locator uh, is connected to the the actor's wand, and then we won't actually need a 3D track. So once we've got things approximately in the right position, we're going to go through this shot. And uh, really the only time consuming part is just spending a couple of minutes going through here. Now because the, there's such a different, because uh, the camera zooms out so much, we're going to begin with just two keyframes. So we have one keyframe at the beginning where the locator is a lot closer to the camera. And now, when we just go through and make tiny little adjustments, uh, the overall Z position of the wand will stay the same. So as you can see, the beam is going to uh, move back as the camera moves back. So I just enabled that so we could just make sure it's uh, looking pretty sensible. And so now we just need to fill in the, the gaps between these two keyframes just by simply using the page up and down keys and the arrow keys. And then it uh, only takes a couple of minutes to get something that's pretty accurate. I actually just go through frame by frame because the, the wand is moving pretty much on every single frame. And so we'll uh, re-enable the motion blur for the, for the core beam so that we can actually see it in the shot. going to darken the plate a little bit because we're just using this as a reference. And 
And so uh, we can see that we've, we've got a strange little issue here. That's our beam isn't actually sticking to the end of the wand. And the reason for that is because our emitter locator is too close to the actor because that actually sucks the beams towards the locator to make sure the beams are always connected. But because it was too close to the wand initially, it was actually pulling the beam away from the wand. So we just need to make sure that we move that back and now everything will be uh, correct as intended. So for this effect, we're only going to really need the the beam and the embers, the floating sparks that kind of fill the screen a little bit. And so now it's just a case of uh, rendering this at full res so that we can actually move into the export comp. So we're just rendering this as an asset with the animation codec. Render this out. Only took 30 minutes this time because we didn't have uh, the entire effect being rendered. And so now, like we did before, we can just bring in our pre-rendered asset into the particles comp. Move that asset to the start of our timeline. And now we can go into the export comp bring in our plate footage that we're using as the background. So we can see the effect is uh, in the scene as we want. Just going to try and get a slightly nicer look to the footage here. And so we're going to disable the keyframes for the distortion because that's only an effect that happens when the beams uh, impact each other. We have this environmental lighting and although it was working pretty perfectly in the previous shot because uh, of the because we have quite a close-up shot we're actually just going to go to the alpha channel in the scene lighting here this is one of the hidden layers and uh, you can see it's using this a uh, corner pin to give some perspective but we can actually just reset this and we're going to try and get a kind of custom lighting setup that looks like it's uh, happening just affecting the uh, floor plane there and give it a bit of extra blur so the lighting is more soft. And so now we'll have our lighting affecting the floor there. We're going to adjust the distance a little bit. And so if we just scrub through our footage, we can see the whole effect coming together. One thing I might do is just check the... Uh, I'm actually thinking we could put a little bit of defocus as I just realized there is a bit of defocus in the shot. So I can just put a camera lens blur just so it matches the defocus of the wand there but of course I'm going to keyframe that so that as the camera moves back and the whole shot comes into focus we get rid of that depth of field and so we could give this a quick preview And so there's a few things I think we need to address here because, I mean, I think there's a few uh, improvements we could make. One thing we could do, for starters, is just put a curves adjustment on the beam here and just get a slightly more deeper looking red. So I think that will benefit the lighting. We'll also put a few extra color correction improvements to the plate as well. So using this Lumetri color will uh, add the same darkness around the edges just to help focus the camera a little bit. And I think um, the main thing that's uh, letting the shot down is that there's no lighting on the actor here. 
So if we duplicate our footage, we're going to use one of those layers to be the the actor lighting. And so we're going to go into the Roto Brush tool in After Effects. And we're just going to get a pretty rough sort of matte for the actor. And even if there are a few imperfections with the mat or any flickering, that will just contribute towards the lighting anyway, so we don't need to be uh, too precious with how accurate this is. And if we go through frame by frame, I'm sure we'll have to make a few uh, adjustments, but uh, once we've done that, we'll have a roto mat that we can use. I'm going to add some motion blur to the roto brush here and also introduce more of a kind of red tone as this is going to be the act uh, the the lighting pass and I've just created a new white solid here I'm going to call this alpha matte and I'm just creating a kind of blurred sort of circular matte here that we can use just to kind of control the lighting so it's not completely even. I just noticed that the uh, the Roto Brush tool is quite slow, so we actually want to go ahead and pre-render the Roto that we did for the actor, making sure that has an alpha channel. So that only took about eight minutes, but it's going to really help speed things up when we're in the export comp. So if we just come in here, we'll get rid of the uh, actor roto here and we'll replace it with the pre-rendered mat that we have because this is much faster to work with and we're going to get a better look at it as well. Now you could roto the whole character. I kind of decided to try and do half the character to see if we could get some more defined lighting. And then I've just used the track mat option to have the alpha to have the character Roto use the white solid uh, as an alpha mat, so we kind of get a gradient here. And then on the actor Roto, we can also put a, a luminance extraction as well, so that we get a, a slightly more subtle lighting effect. And then when we add the, the curves adjustment back on top of that, that's just a little bit of extra red, we can now see that we have uh, this lighting on our character. I'm also just going to put a wiggle expression on the opacity just so there's a little bit of variation. We are getting a, a bit of a weird halo fringe around the edges of the mat here. So one thing we can do now that we've pre-rendered the mat is add a refine soft mat adjustment. And if we just use the decontaminate edge color and maybe a tiny bit of feathering, it'll just kind of clean up those edges a little bit. And so let's continue going forward. Now most of the lighting is kind of going on the arm there, so we're going to want to adjust that. And uh, let's also put a wiggle expression on the mask expansion as well. Because this is going to be like a flickering lightning, so uh, the, more, the more subtlety we put into the lighting itself, the more realistic things are going to look. So I'm going for 6 for the speed and 80 for the amount, and that's giving us a nice wiggle expression for this alpha mat. So we go through this again, starting to improve, although probably a bad idea to roto only half of the actor there because uh, it's giving quite a harsh edge. So... Um, you know, in hindsight, probably would have been better to do the whole actor, and then we could uh, decide how much we want to remove. But uh, to compensate for that, I'm just going to add a custom roto mask here and just try and feather those edges a little bit. So we don't get such a harsh fall off of opacity. If I just increase the exposure there, we'll get a better view. So just simply a case of making sure there are no harsh edges. 
And so I think if we give things another preview, see if there's any other... I think if we expand the mask expansion at the beginning, we'll get more lighting on the actor's face, which is what we really wanted there. And if I maybe darken the background a little bit as well, we'll, we'll get more contrast between the lighting. And so this is coming together. Let's give things one more pre-render here. I think maybe have a little bit more red on the actor there because this Expelliarmus effect is will look a little bit better if we match the colours. And uh, the, the amount of lighting on the actor's arm there is really kind of throwing me off. So we're just going to add one more subtraction mask with quite a large feathering amount just so we can uh, get a more balanced lighting. And if we just go through and just every now and again just you know adjust things so that the, the lighting is never too harsh in a particular area. And of course, the, the best thing would be to have some lighting on set to really bring uh, the realism. But we can actually do quite a quite a bit with uh, fake lighting. So this is looking good, but um, I think we can still improve things even further because uh, I think the turbulence on the beam here uh, isn't really as as aesthetically pleasing as it could be. So since this is a, a live simulation, we can just go into the casting controls. And I'm, what I'm going to do is just put a keyframe for the beam turbulence there. So that at the beginning, we have the full amount of turbulence. But then when the camera pans back and we see the beam becoming quite squiggly. In this uh, particular example, I'm just going to reduce the beam turbulence there. So... And uh, let's give that another look. What I'm just doing there is just uh, putting a little keyframe on the impact locator so that the, uh, the beam doesn't change direction there. So, And also the beginning of the beam itself is looking a little bit too thick. Uh, that might just be because we didn't have enough perspective, but if I just go into the the actual beam layers, go to the particle size and just put a little uh, curve there, that'll just add some extra size. I'm also just going to increase the turbulence speed to 300 and the beam velocity to 5000. And these settings are just going to basically make things a little bit more chaotic. So as you can see, the, the size adjustment there is just kind of adding a bit of forced perspective on that beam. And now the turbulence will be a little bit faster as well. So hopefully that should give us a more sort of chaotic, natural looking result. And if we look at the result of those changes, as you can see, I think that's quite a big improvement. And all, all we had to do was just tweak a few settings. And when it all comes together, it looks something like this. Okay, we'll wrap things up there. Make sure to download Trap Code Magic to get access to all of these new spells. And be sure to check out the other tutorials in this series on using Trap Code Magic. Stay tuned for more content, good luck with your projects, and thanks for watching.